That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Boss Level, the seventh film directed by Joe Carnahan, which will be streaming on Hulu as of March 5th, 2021, uh, and premiered, I believe, earlier in the U.S. in February. Do you know any of Joe's other films? Why, yes. Um, Can I'm, you tell us? I'm actually, I, I, I have fond memories of, I haven't watched it in years, uh, his sophomore film, Narc, with Ray Liotta and uh, Jason Patrick. Uh, I never saw Smoking, Smoke and Aces, that has a kind of a cult following. Um, and I actually liked his uh, Liam Neeson Fighting the Wolves uh, film, The Grey, back in 2011, which sure had some problems, but had a nice mood. Um, and his last film was Stretch, starring Patrick Wilson, which was just released on Blu-ray, uh, which I wasn't so much a fan of. Boss Level revolves around a man named Roy, who's well, played by Frank Grillo. Mm -hmm. The narrative is like Groundhog's Day, or Happy Death Day, or a number of other films where we find this character waking up to the same day over <clears> and over <throat> again, and we find Roy on his 140th day. And when he wakes up, he's immediately attacked by a man wielding a machete. Mm -hmm. and which you'll see a lot of. Which you'll see a lot of. Um, basically, there is a big boss man named Colonel... Clive Venter. Played by Mel Gibson. Mm -hmm. He runs a corporation called Dynow. D-Y-N-O-W, but listen to how it sounds. <laughs> so, the Colonel is is attempting to create something called Osiris's Spindle. The Osiris Spindle. The Osiris Spindle, which basically... Don't prick your needle on it. <laughs> prick your finger on it. That should be the tagline. <laughs> this movie should be called uh, Osiris Spindle. Osiris Spindle. Um, it, like, uh, can manipulate space and time. Um, as its inventor, or whoever, she's fiddling around with it. Naomi Watch says that it unmasks all of time and space. He wants to use it for nefarious reasons. He likens <clears throat> it to, or he likens himself kind of to Hitler. There are Hitler. Which I find it interesting that Mel Gibson would uh, say that, but whatever. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so he's nefarious. The, the scientist who Naomi Watts plays has created it, but she doesn't really understand how it works, but she knows that she's in tr that like the world's in trouble, that he's going to use it for evil. So she uses Roy, who's her baby's daddy, as like a guinea pig. Mm -hmm. And instead of just straight up telling him like, this is what's happening, she gives him a book for his birthday with a message inside and then whispers in his ear when she sees him like, don't forget Osiris. So she gives him this very coded message that ultimately means that he, if this thing works, he will be able to sort of like, well, she doesn't even know that he will be waking up every day in a new day, but somehow, I'm having a hard time explaining it because the film doesn't really you're, explain you're it. You're doing just fine. But uh, that maybe he can save the day. And he does. Every day that he wakes up, he learns a little bit more. Initially, he has no clue what's going on, but starts to get pieces and realizes that he needs to stop uh, the Mel Gibson character, the Colonel, from proceeding with his plan. Mm -hmm. And he's successful. At the hour mark, he successfully kills uh, the Colonel, but that's not the end of the movie, sadly, uh, because as it's mentioned, the Osiris Spindle can destroy the world if it's not used properly, and that's what happens. So Roy sees the end of the world. So he realizes that he needs to figure out another plan. Mm -hmm. So through one way or another, he finds out that he assumes Gemma's dead because he sees that she's been killed. But he finds out that she's killed like 15 minutes after he wakes up because he had been assuming that she died before he wakes up. Mm -hmm. So the last like 15 minutes of the film is him trying to get to her before she's killed. Mm -hmm. And he's successful. He saves her, and she says, even though I don't know how any of this works, if you go inside this machine, you might be the missing link to why I couldn't figure out this thing that I don't know anything about. And he does. He but, steps in. But she can't die this time. <laughs> yeah. So he, it appears that it works because then we see him wake up the next morning, 
and it, it looks like time is back on track. He's still going to be attacked by all these people who are trying to kill him, mm -hmm. but he winks at the camera and says, like, I got this. The end. I know there are people who will like this film. Yes. So I don't want to shit on it. It definitely wasn't for me. But I think it just feels derivative. And, the, and because it has such a familiar plot mechanism, I think the story needs to be that much more engaging. And this one wasn't. So it was very tedious. And when we hit the mark, the hour mark, when Mel Gibson, like the big, the boss man, the boss level is defeated... When I found out we had 30 minutes left, I was this close to just giving up. I was so bored and annoyed. Same. Uh, but let's talk about let's talk about what we liked. You say <clears throat> I always hear what Sorry, I want to. I had a I only hear what I want to. Shawarma for dinner. Um, <laughs> you say I know who Frank Grillo is. I can't believe that I don't recall him. So to me, this was the first time seeing him. I liked him. He's very handsome. He's mature. He, that man's in his 50 and his body is shaming all these kids out here. I think he has great screen presence. Yeah. Yeah. So I really enjoyed him. And his little pompadour. His well, the hair. Shea wig and pompadour. Yeah. His, his little hair situation had its own assistant, I'm sure. Because it's very... Uh, There's a scene where Naomi Watts like secretly snips some of his hair. It's like a man that age that is doing that to his hair would be so pressed. If but anyway, he's the highlight. I think the film looks fine. I think the action sequences are pretty standard, but I think they're well done enough. There are a couple that stand out a little bit, but overall it they feel about as monotony, monotonously choreographed as the rhythm of the film. So I guess we're going into what didn't work. Well, Go ahead. I mean, I like Frank Grillo a <laughs> lot, and I think that uh, a lead role uh, in a film of, with this kind of production value behind it with, you know, Carnahan and um, I think it's a big deal for him. Um, you know, he, he's in The Purge, Anarchy, he's in a ton of stuff. Okay, well, I don't uh, remember, so... <clears throat> but thank you for reminding me. <laughs> but I think a lot of this has to do with a, a script that needed to be elevated at some point. Uh, it was written by Chris and Eddie Borey, uh, who we won't talk about that last name, uh, whose last film was 2013's Open Grave with Charlotte Copley, uh, which I remember also kind of having a similar problem with, like some ideas that are potentially interesting but are kind of hobbled by cliché. Uh, early on in the film, Roy says that what's happening is a bunch of assholes I've never met kill me for reasons that remain a mystery. And I think that that pretty much sums up this movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very basic. I'm still very unclear, actually, now that I think about it, although my mind was wandering a lot, uh, about how all of those uh, villains fit in. So I didn't explain that well. So it's kind of set up like a video game yes. in that there are different like enemies attacking him, and they all kind of have a persona, a visual aesthetic, and a method of killing him, which sounds interesting, but it's not. Like, they're not that well executed. Mm -hmm. Particularly the one whose name I can't recall, but she's the Asian lady. Oh, Guan Yin. Guan Yin. Yeah, and her the line she has to and say. And she has a line that says, "I am Guan Yin, and Guan Yin has done this." And she says it every time she kills him. And she says it like, what, fifteen, twenty times. It wasn't funny the first time. And then when Roy kills her, he says, "I am Roy, and Roy has done this." And I call that a mile away. Mm -hmm. That's like the level of humor that's yes. in this film. Uh, you know, like I, I wasn't, I don't think the movie's funny. It's not smart enough to be like a puzzle I want to piece together. No. The action is not, again, I know some people will like this. I didn't think the action was enough to send me over. So I'm a little confused like how I would even classify this, like an action film, I guess? Yeah, it's, a, it's an action comedy, really. Um, th but there are some, like, tender moments. There's, the, I think, his actual son playing his kid, and they're, they're trying to inject some of that, which kind of messes with the tone of it, too, because, like, suddenly we're supposed to believe that you are all gung-ho about caring for this child. Right, because the sense we get is that he doesn't really keep up with his kid. And then because he knows, like, the world's going to end, and he's on a loop, he gets to know his son very well. Which I suppose is an opportunity, but that more poignant aspect of the plot is undermined by the silliness of the I, rest of it. I think the, the, the level of how derivative this feels, I, I think to me, is kind of unforgivable because everything since Groundhog Day, um, I always want to say Groundhog Day. I do too. Um, 
everything has what what new what's something new besides being about a video game and then using a soundtrack selection that feels like you're trying to ape Guardians of the Galaxy's vintage um, grooves because uh, no, uh, nearly none of the soundtrack selections were like Boston and a bunch of other 70s retro familiar retro songs that don't fit the scenery and a lot of you know a really great cast but a lot of them feel very incredibly wasted like Naomi Watts really has nothing to do and has no chemistry with Frank Grillo Michelle Yao is uh, trains him in uh, sword fighting and <clears throat> you know she's a to me a very important presence if you have her in your film and she's she really has nothing to do besides some action sequences Ken Ken Jung is that his name yeah from the hangover films mm -hmm. He's in it. He works. He works at a diner, and Roy visits the diner every day. And there's also a gentleman named Dave, who's like a security expert. And their interactions, especially Ken Jeong, is just it's he. He's not funny. He's doing what he does. And well, I think he can be funny. He's just not funny in this movie. But something that does happen that I did think was kind of interesting is Roy figures out that these like enemies are able to locate him because he has a tracker embedded in him mm -hmm. and dave the security guy is all about it. Sean, telling, sean mckinley i actually think that character was the only bit of humor in this film that worked for me frank grillo had a couple lines that that do work well okay yes so the the secu there's a scene where like dave or roy is pulling out his teeth in an effort to find the tracker i thought that scene was kind of the flavor that i probably would have appreciated more in this sure film. sure getting back to roy's humor he makes several off-color jokes and, and goodness it, knows that i am not always appropriate but these felt dated in the narration yeah there, it, there's one that com comes early on that doesn't even make sense uh about he, he pulls some guy out of a car that I guess he does every morning on his his, his purge and uh, it says he screams louder than someone than date rape violence like yeah yeah I mean he interesting choice. yeah there are a couple Hitler references again Which I know are, there's nothing wrong with Hitler no references. there's not and you know I don't want to be labeled sensitive even though I think that's not an appropriate way to describe how this feels but um, I, it just felt dated it felt like 20 years ago in, in, in kind of a lazy way, a, a way to be provocative, but also since it's not smart enough to be that provocative, it, it comes across as problematic. Um, uh, you have an appointment in six minutes, but uh, so my last few notes are, I think Mel looks good. Mel Gibson. Mel has, also has nothing to do. But he yes. has nothing to do. Yeah. There's even, a, he's, he looks like they just placed him some, like on a stage with a light and a, a boom mic and he's reciting his lines, and then Roy even says to him, like, oh, it sounds like you just memorized these words to tell me. Which I thought was funny because that's what I thought as he was saying that. And it, it's also, immediately as it started, I kept thinking, um, before the pandemic, there were all those trailers for that Ryan Reynolds movie, Free Guy, which has been moved to later this year, which is a very similar story and video game slant as this. Yeah, but the Ryan Reynolds movie looks like they really leaned in on the video game. Yes, aspect. for sure. This course. the video game com element of this film is very light, and by light I mean they have like some eighties like eight bit graphics of like round one forty, round one seventy six. That's it, and then you get little like sort of like do 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 like, and an arcade scene. But uh, there is an arcade scene. But it's not at the level that actually, if this movie weren't named boss level, it wouldn't have even occurred to me that it's kind of set up like, like a video game. Sure. Uh, anything else? Um, I guess there, there are other people in the cast room that had nothing to do like Will Sasso and Annabelle Wallace. Oh, I did write down that seeing Will Sasso be serious is kind of weird. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> uh, but, but also that, yeah. And, and Annabelle Wallace too is kind of an explicit role. She's the woman that's in bed with him every morning. The dentist that plants the... Who implants the tracking device. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because you've seen her in a ton of stuff, too. And she had nice hair. Yeah. It's pretty. What would you give this movie? Um, uh, t one and a half out of five. I would give it one and a half out of five as well. Thank you. Bye.